And uh, we do so thank uh, Sheila and our regulars and Quentin uh, leading worship for us when uh, the Mangums had an important family wedding to attend. Uh, we are blessed here, so thank you all uh, for leading us in this uh, space we haven't seen for a while. Uh, right before things happened, there was all kinds of renovations and improvements happening. We had a Building for the Future campaign. At that point, we had no idea what the future was going to hold. Uh, but we're really glad that we did build for the future and we can enjoy uh, this space and people who went above and beyond to uh, provide it, not just for... Uh, for the youth on Sunday nights, which by the way is every Sunday night at five, um, uh, but for our worship community too. Um, so um, today uh, we're gonna be talking about worrying, or rather not worrying. Does anybody have something to be worried about today? I'm just wondering, raise your hand if you have something to be worried about. How oh, good, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, so uh, we've been through a lot uh, this year uh, you can recount it, and I don't know that it'll make you feel better about all the stuff that this year uh, brought us, but there is stuff uh, to worry about. You know, um, a few weeks ago, one of our, uh, one of our only founding members um, said, you know, when I grew up, I, I remember having a pretty carefree life. I don't remember really having to worry about much. And this now uh, senior in our church says he feels bad for the young people today and all that they have to carry on their minds. Um, so this is a timely topic for today for people of all ages. We've, we've had to adjust in so many ways and yet God is greater and God is with us and everything that that song just told us is true. All right, let's go to scripture. We are in Matthew 6 today. Um, starting with verse 24. This is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what is worry? Uh, the Greek word is merimeo, and depending on where you are in the New Testament, sometimes it's translated worry, and sometimes it's translated concern. It all depends on the context and if it's more or less a good kind of concern or a bad kind of worry. And the, the key divider there, is it in proportion to the thing or is the thing that you're concerned or worry about, is the object itself not the right thing to be concerned or worried about? And so worry is bad and concern is okay as long as you're concerned about the right things. In other parts of the Bible, it says uh, that Paul had a burden or a concern to share the gospel uh, with people. That would be a good thing. Mostly of what Jesus talks about here is the essentials of life, what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, and being overly obsessed with these sorts of things 
in crowding out or putting blinders on, not including God into the picture where all of the weight, all of the burden sits right here to be sure that we survive and we're okay. Uh, that's not the kind of life that Jesus, I believe, uh, wants for anybody. And so as people who have cause for probably a lot of worries uh, coming today, we come to this passage. It's not at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount because in Jesus' mind, worry is really not the most important thing. You remember what is at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount? Anybody? It's the Beatitudes. Blessed are uh, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All of these ways in which people who humbly uh, come to God, even in the midst of brokenness and hardship and mourning and grief, uh, how God is present and blesses them anyway. It's the upside downness of God's kingdom that's way counter to all the things of the world in terms of their values, the things that they seek after. Jesus presents a very different set of values out there than the values of the world. He starts there and here in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount lifts up this idea of worry and if you find you're being worried something is probably wrong and he gives us some counsel to send us in the right direction. Um, now, um, I, I too worry a lot. I'm preaching to myself uh, this morning and it'd be easy to hear this message as, well, as if we didn't feel bad enough already, now we're supposed to feel bad about worrying about it. Uh, I don't think that's what Jesus intends here. He intends to, uh, to, to bring freedom, to bring liberation from all of this weight that we carry that we were never intended to carry in the life of Christian faith. Here he's saying, don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, um, what you're going to drink. And um, par part of us, we, we might read that and think, you know, Jesus, there's probably some people in that crowd, in the Sermon on the Mount, it was at, at Mount Arbel, uh, some of you have been there on the Israel trips. Uh, there's a mix of folks, but there are mostly people who are following Jesus. So he's not trying to convert the masses. He's trying to disciple those who are already following him. Um, and so uh, here he's, uh, he's, he's talking to some of them who are, who are wealthy, some who have means. They don't have any reason to worry about food. They, it's okay. And others who are just scraping by to make it. Um, and with, as we bring this advice from Jesus to us today, we're tempted to say, Jesus, the, you know, food insecurity is a real thing today. You know, we, we know about our world and even in the blessedness of, the, of our country, uh, there are people who go without and they, they don't know where it's coming. Is that kind of rude for you, Jesus, to just tell people like that, don't worry about it, it'll be all right. The thing is, though, um, the people in Jesus' time probably had it worse than people who have food insecurity today in our country. And so what's going on here? Does Jesus, who seems to be so abounding in compassion all the time, has, has, is it missing here? I don't think so. He has a really important message to, that goes to both uh, wealthy people and poor people and everybody in between, and it's this. If you spend your whole life worrying about just how to survive you're not really living there's a lot of people uh, who are so consumed with with worrying uh, they they haven't really lived long before the time that they actually die and Jesus is trying to to bring life and hope and faith uh, that's going to connect people to the real power source of God um, who is going to take care of them um, so, and he gives them reasons, he doesn't just tell them, don't worry, he gives them good reasons why they shouldn't worry. He tells them that uh, the birds, the lilies, they don't, they don't worry, but God provides for them. And so, he also says, worrying doesn't help, it doesn't make a difference. He's not saying, don't be responsible, don't do anything, 
He's saying, don't let it become such an obsession that it weighs you down because it doesn't help anything. It can't, uh, it can't help anybody uh, even add an hour to their life. That's what it says here in verse 27. Can anyone of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Even when life is hard, there's more to it than surviving. And there's eternal value because we're all children of God. A God who loves us is not detached in some faraway place, but is very active and present and aware of our needs even before uh, we tell him. Here's what Jesus did not mean. He didn't mean, don't worry about it, so don't work. Uh, there's lots of parts in the Bible where work is a, is a good thing. In the New Testament, uh, it says we're supposed to try to provide for our families. And even when you look to the analogies, even birds work. If you watch birds carefully, you see them, that God is providing for them. But they're flying, they're making nests, they're gathering food, they're feeding their young. So uh, Jesus doesn't mean, it, it doesn't mean not working. And it doesn't mean uh, no planning. Joseph, in the Old Testament, he helped save a nation by planning for a, a, a drought that was going to come and planning ahead, and God uh, led him in that direction. Um, and uh, there's also Proverbs 31, where uh, a woman is preparing for winter and being very industrious and productive with their time. Uh, and so what Jesus is not saying is don't have any ambition in life. Just go with the flow. Um, he's, and here's what Daniel M. Doriani says about it. He says to seek first the kingdom of God. And that means, it doesn't mean that Christians lack ambition. Rather, it means that we have different ambitions. It's a contrast from the world to the kingdom of God. In 1 Thessalonians 4.11, it says we're to lead quiet and productive lives. In 2 Corinthians 5, 9, it says we are to try to please God. And so the teacher tells us to keep God and his kingdom first. First in our thinking and not an afterthought after we do everything we can without any thought to God and then get in a bind. No, he says seek first the kingdom of God and then everything is going to be okay. Things are going to work out. God is with you. You are blessed in the brokenness. Um, the word for seek is zateo. It means to look for, to seek out, to try to obtain, to strive for. And here at the very center of the Sermon on the Mount, that's where Jesus brings it back. He has worry, these false gods of materialism, of focusing on that, of worrying about everything and says, if, if you're worrying, this is a flag, this is a false god to us. No, instead, seek first the kingdom of God, and that's the ambition of a Christian. Uh, Doriani goes on to say, and kind of spells out what seeking first the kingdom of God might kind of really actually mean in real practical life. Um, he says, uh, we can afford to seek the kingdom first, because God will give us all the things that the Gentiles chase after. Lest this be reduced to a mere a slogan, let us explore how Jesus would have us seek the kingdom, drawing on his own instruction. To seek the kingdom is to seek the king, to love him as savior and friend, to bow to him as Lord, to trust God who has chosen us, redeemed us, and taught us to trust him. To seek the kingdom is to pray for it, your kingdom come. To pray for kingdom causes, not just for our local and personal concerns. To seek the kingdom is to evangelize, that is, to bring others into the kingdom, to introduce them to our king's uh, beneficent reign over all of life. To seek the kingdom is to desire that God be known and glorified as king throughout the earth. To seek the kingdom is to submit personally to God's reign by obeying him. We seek the kingdom when we obey God at some personal cost. To seek the kingdom means to have an eye on social reform so that society may at least approximate the justice that God desires. It means dethroning wealth and possessions as our first pursuits. 
that's a little sharper vision about what it means to seek first the kingdom and not worry about uh, our needs and our own, isn't it? How many of you were here for the outdoor worship service where Dr. Dr. Dupree, the superintendent of Fort Bend uh, Independent School District, spoke? A few of you here? He gave a really, really good testimony. Um, Even in his first minute, uh, in the introductory remarks, said, here's Dr. Dupree. He probably gets a lot of emails and probably has had a lot of sleepless nights. And uh, I remember when he got up, he said, you are right. I get a lot of emails, but I don't have any sleepless nights. He said he, he leaves it there, and he talked about nurturing a relationship with God, where walking and praying and being part of a team, uh, that was what allowed him to not have sleepless nights, to not worry, to seek first the kingdom, to do your best, to be responsible, not to sit back and just see what happens, but to pursue things responsibly, you know, centered in the values of the kingdom of God. So I loved, I loved hearing that uh, testimony about seeking first the kingdom of God and leaving the rest up to God and not worrying. Verses 31 to 32 say, the people of the world, the pagans, that's what they do. That's all they do. They focus on what they need and they go after it. But Jesus isn't talking to them here. He's talking to the followers. He's saying, we're a forgetful people. Sometimes we revert back to operating in the world, you know, without the benefit of a faith perspective, without the values of the kingdom coming in and informing our our judgments. Um, Excessive worry is a sign that you've swung back over and it's time to hit the switch and come back and allow God to change our vision and to take those burdens that we're needlessly uh, taking upon ourselves. Here's what N.T. Wright says about this passage. Put the world first, and you'll find it gets moth-eaten in your hands. Put God first, and you'll get the world thrown in. That's pretty good. Uh, So I mentioned uh, I'm preaching to myself today. I actually had choice of what the sermon topic and scripture was today and I I chose this topic not because I'm an expert but because uh, I needed help in preaching to myself I don't know if you do Enneagram stuff but Enneagram 6 is the worriers in life some people have different struggles for Enneagram 6 uh, you have you have trouble uh, with with trusting with trusting God for your security to be there and not trying to uh, overwork the mind and creating systems of support and security. And so that's a step of faith. That's a faith walk. And it's a challenge I'm making today, reading this, don't worry about tomorrow. That's, that's not an easy passage to read when it's Saturday and you're preaching on Sunday. Sunday's part of it. Sunday's a big point of worry. And so I'm walking with you all today. Um, uh, And so the Apostle Paul, I think, gives us some practical advice. Jesus gives us the foundation on the Sermon on the Mount of how things are supposed to be. And the Apostle Paul says, uh, if you want something, some real practical steps of what to do when you know worry is an issue, here's what you do. Uh, Let's look at verses 7 and 8. We have a slide. Don't worry about anything, exact same word that Jesus said, worry. Instead, pray. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Instead of worrying... We pray. It doesn't say you're necessarily going to get what you're praying for, but it says you're going to get peace. It's going to transcend your understanding. It's going to guard your mind. It's going to guard your heart. It's going to be different. It's going to be better. You're probably going to feel lighter. Pastor Michelle heads up the prayer ministries. I know she goes to the prayer room quite a bit, and I suspect every time she comes out of that experience, she feels a little bit lighter. Amen, Michelle? Amen. Uh, 
Here's what uh, Pastor Mark Batterson says about it. Can our prayers change our circumstances? Absolutely. But when our circumstances don't change, it's often an indication that God is trying to change us. But either way, the chief objective remains the same, to glorify God in any and every situation. Some of the practical prayer tips I've had, you've heard of breath prayers. They're just short one phrase kind of prayers they fit in one breath that's why i call them a breath prayer when you feel the anxiety or the worry mounting find a suitable phrase i find the, the phrase uh, jesus be lord over fill in the blank whatever it is whatever is on you uh name it and lift it up to god jesus be lord over this situation be lord over this person be Lord over me. And pray that prayer silently or out loud as a breath prayer. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your might, lean not on your own understanding, in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. That word trust, that's the challenge for the warriors, is trust. The Hebrew word is batach. And uh, that's even a funner breath prayer to pray because you can go in it. Batach. That's prayer. That's a great breath prayer. I do it all the time. Um, lately, uh, my journey has taken me into learning more about Christian lament and what that, um, what that means. Uh, it's to bring whatever concern you have to God that doesn't seem to be going away. And it may not go away for a while. Um, but you take it and you give it and you call upon the goodness of God and what you know about God and God's power and what God's ultimate will could be and you try to bring these together and that's where the weight comes off you appeal to God's mercy to intervene and bring redemption to particular situations either your own situation or a person or a people group that you care about uh, that really needs God's help in a big way. Um, the difference between worrying and lamenting, like the, the difference between worrying and praying, is bringing it to God to carry the weight instead of us trying to carry it ourselves outside of a relationship with God. When we leave, um, and so it, there's, there is at least one good thing about social media, I know it's gotten a, a blast lately, but sometimes it helps you find good worship bands. And uh, as I was listening, uh, and worship, is, uh, worship music is also a wonderful uh, pathway to trust. And, and that kind of meditative singing that just as we were doing earlier. And um, there's a band I discovered through s someone's post called The Porter's Gate. And during the pandemic, they, they met in an outdoor setting where they could record and they did two albums, one called Justice, one called Lament. And this was the harsh um, circumstances of our time and just leaving it um, to God and offering it as worship uh, song for others uh, to do the same. So I'd like to take just a couple of minutes here um, for some uh, silence as we listen to this song uh, that's called uh, Jesus Wake Up. And at first I thought, well, this is really irreverent. Um, to say, Jesus, wake up, we got problems. Uh, but it's actually talking about the story when the disciples are in the boat in the storm. And they're terrified. They thought they were going to die. And they wake up Jesus because uh, he was sleeping. He wasn't worried at all. And Christian lament is... Um, is taking those things that we're worried about and say, God help, God help us. And it may take a while, it may take a while, but that relationship is something that God calls us to, to be in the relationship in the in-between, in that tension, in those pain points that we share uh, with our Lord who can carry all the weight that we really uh, cannot. So we're going to uh, 
we're going to advance this slide and just as these as just for a couple of minutes here and there's also the a painting of jesus in the boat with the disciples by rembrandt and you can look at that too as a as a point of reflection Jesus, when you gonna wake up? When you gonna wake up and calm this raging sea? Jesus, when you gonna wake up? When you gonna wake up? I can't be sleeping. Just one word from the maker And all the ways be still Just one touch from the healer And all will be made well So Jesus, when you gonna wake up Just one word from the maker, and all the ways will be made still. Just one touch from the healer, and all will be made well. Just one word from the maker, and all the ways will be made still. Just one touch from the Jesus, when you gonna wake up? Some interpret that as Jesus appeared to be sleeping and it was an opportunity to grow in faith, to reach out to the one who can help. And that's what, what God wants from, from each of us. And what makes our faith stronger isn't carrying a whole lot over a long period of time, over a long distance, it is not so much how much weight you're lifting, it's how much weight you're shifting. That is the faith growing experience. Um, when we live fully present with Christ and see how God is at work in creation, how he cares for us, how he cares for creation, and then choose to trust him with all of our lives, all of our lives, even the things that we're worried about, Jesus is offering us a call to be fully alive, fully alive only in him and not lost in worry. Even when and especially when things are not resolved and they don't seem like they're going to be resolved anytime soon, even in the middle of the storms and the battles of life. God is with us and calls us to shift that weight over to him and listen to the to the birds of the air and see the lilies of the field and seek first the kingdom of God and all of this other will get thrown in let's pray almighty God you are real you are over everything including the things that worry us. Today, Lord, help us to turn them over to you and to stay in a kingdom that is not of this world, but is of you, O oh God. Remind us that life is more than just survival. Help our energy to be focused on you and not the ways of the world. 
In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. We have a, a closing song here. Um, watching the clock a little bit, maybe we can do the short version of our close song as uh, the Lord leads us to continue to surrender to him and to shift the weight from here to him.